So, hi everyone, my name is Michael Stipe and I'm going to talk about GraphQL today. I'm a GraphQL TC, that means I'm working on the spec committee and I'm also the author of the hot chocolate GraphQL library in .NET. So what we're going to do is explore what GraphQL is and explore why we should use it and what modern applications really are. So let's dive right in. So what is GraphQL? And uh, a more correct question would be, why is GraphQL? Why should I use GraphQL and why has Facebook created GraphQL in the first place? So back in the day, and we're talking here around 2009, 2010 maybe, uh, Facebook released its first version of the Facebook mobile app. And it didn't went so well because the app got a lot of backlash and it didn't look like this, it looked more like uh, this piece. Um, and users were complaining about the app performance, mainly about slow startup times, high data usage, and um, it really drained your battery quickly. So when I say high data usage, we are talking 2010, also up to 2012 maybe. And remember what kind of data plans you had back then with your mobile phones. Maybe 200 megabytes? I don't know. So it was not a lot. And uh, this Facebook app, uh, it could drain your data plan in maybe a day, two, because they did a lot of um, mistakes in the application design. Actually, when the Facebook engineers, it was three Facebook engineers that looked into that, they discovered we have done actually everything right. We used REST, we used HTML5 for building a mobile application because Mark Zuckerberg believed very early into the promises of HTML5. And yeah, they used REST because that's what they used in their desktop application, in their web browser application. The issue that they discovered is what the client application would do is maybe when you start up your mobile application, it would call out to this Facebook API to get the current user. And it would fetch the current user. The, fetching the current user through the REST API is actually around 50 properties. But we only needed three in our mobile application because we had a lot less to display there. But it's not only that we needed these three properties. Actually, to make sense and show us so the news feed of Facebook in the mobile application, we would do another call, pass in the ID that we fetched initially, and then asked for the news feed of Facebook. And this API was also designed for the web application that we originally had from Facebook. So it would go and also around now, 50, 60 properties would it fetch. But in our mobile application, because remember the mobile devices we had back in the days, we just needed a couple of properties here, maybe four. But what you can see already here is we are fetching the news feed and you can see all these IDs in there. So we have an author ID and we have an ID for the actual news story and we're still not done here because maybe we want to also show the comments in our newsfeed. So we would grab some of these IDs and yeah, call the next REST endpoint. And that's not because REST is designed badly. It's more that REST has this concept of resources where I have my um, silos of data. So I have maybe a user endpoint, a news endpoint, a comments endpoint and so on. And I would call and feed into these APIs certain information to fetch more information. So what they discovered is that they had a data fetching graph like this. We call that a data waterfall, where each consecutive request needs information from its previous. That means we cannot parallelize. And now think about the mobile applications back in the days where we had 2G and 3G. It was I'm, I'm not swearing here, but it was very, very, very slow. And even today, if you're sitting on the bus, you're not guaranteed to have 5G. So um, 
mobile applications that use REST are prone to be very slow and also have like these um, interruptions where we don't get the right data and have to start over and fetch it again. And that's why we used so much data when we used the Facebook app originally. So there are different approaches to that. And back then there were a couple of companies looking into that problem. One was Netflix, they had an approach. Uh, one was Facebook, there were also others like Airbnb and so on. And uh, they came up with something called the BFF pattern. So the best friends forever, no, it's a back end for front end. And um, you would write essentially one aggregation layer per application type. And that's good, because now we have a perfectly aligned backend for our frontend. So we didn't have all these problems because we get exactly what we need. We have the exact request that we need for our application and everything is easy to consume. But the downsides of this approach is that we have a ton of code duplication. We have a backend that we have to build for each application. We have to deploy it and then also it couples very close to our downstream services so it makes everything very difficult to maintain and to update over time. So that is where Netflix actually had the idea. They had the same problem. You can see they had tons of devices and they would do the aggregation of their data per application on the client side. So their idea was uh, an iteration of the BFF pattern. So they th rethought it and um, came to the conclusion that we have to break the boundaries and put some of the client code actually in the backend. They called that the client adapter pattern, where they had like a layer on top of their Java API to aggregate the data for the, for the specific client already in the backend. So they broke kind of the layers that we usually know and introduced this client adapter code. And that was already a bit more efficient than aggregating data on the client side. But it actually was not good. Uh, we had several of the downsides that we have with the BFF pattern uh, and it was very proprietary. So that's where GraphQL comes in and GraphQL reverses the way we think about data. It reverses the responsibility of crafting the request, defining what data you need. So in GraphQL, and this is basically the hello world of GraphQL, in this GraphQL query, I'm asking for the current design and user, and from this user, I want the name. And if I send that to my GraphQL server, I want to get a response that looks like that. And uh, this is basically like the JSON, um, yeah, you could think of it like we're sending an empty JSON graph in, it's a wrong concept, but it's a good mental picture to start thinking about it. And the GraphQL server basically fills it up with data. And it's not only about flat data structures. As I change my components, create new components, have new application types, I can just change my request, craft new requests, and get exactly what I want. But when we look at that request, we can see that GraphQL is not about flat data structures. It's actually about trees of data. A more correct name would be TreeQL. It's not a GraphQL, but... Uh, they had problems with the name. So as we go for and iterate on our request, we can uh, drill into relational data. GraphQL is great where it's concerned with other things, like we had this example where I want the news stories to my user or the friends to my user. I can just drill in into this tree and explore related data. Behind that, there might be tons of microservices, a real DB or whatever, and we would aggregate that data on the back end where it's really fast to do so, and then only send the data down to the client that we need. So at this point, we have to talk about 
the client side of GraphQL actually. Because GraphQL was developed by backend engineers, many client and uh, front end engineers don't realize that, but it was actually developed. The guy that actually came up with that was Nick Schrock initially, and he's a backend engineer. But still, we have this reversed concept where the front end engineer actually tells us what he or she needs. And we have another concept here, and that is something we call a fragment. A fragment is a data component, and the idea behind that is, let's have a look a bit at a bit React here, that in your components, in your front-end components, you could specify the contract for this component, the data contract. So the fragment that I have down here specifies the data that my component needs to work. And then as I write these fragments in my component code and compose my component, I'm actually composing GraphQL requests. So the GraphQL fetch that we have in modern applications are highly optimized. For instance, this is a crypto marketplace we built as a demo application here. And no matter what I'm doing here, it will only be one GraphQL request. You can see I'm data fetching all this data here. It's one GraphQL request. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. It's always just a single request. And that's why GraphQL is so highly efficient. And I didn't have to craft this request. Actually, I just composed React components. And by composing them, they built this GraphQL request. Let me show you that a bit. So when we look at this request structure here, you can actually see this is my request from the component I showed you there, this guy here. And you can see these are all my fragments, my data components. And you can see we have here maybe the viewer header fragments, so the top level thing, or the viewer stats fragments. These are all my components in React. And each of these components basically told the server, I need this kind of data for my component to work. And that's what the GraphQL server really fulfills at the end, the components that you need in your front end. OK. So GraphQL gives us this unified API that we backend engineers want, but it gives us also the perfect optimized API for each of our device types, client types, or even just people who want to query your business layer. So GraphQL gives clients the power to ask for what they want and give them exactly what they ask for. So what is GraphQL? So from a, spec, from a spec side, it's a query language, and I see I miss my Y here, so I have to fix that afterwards. But it's a query language for your API, and it's a runtime to fulfill your query. And that makes it fundamentally different from things like OpenAPI Swagger, because there you have essentially a schema that you could even handwrite, and it's assumed from your runtime. So there's nothing enforcing the schema in your runtime code. With GraphQL, it's different. If I, as a backend engineer, do a mistake, then GraphQL will protect my client from getting that mistake, and the other way around. What that means, we will explore. So with GraphQL, I have a single endpoint, because I just need one endpoint to issue all my queries. And I can for, ask for all the data I need in each of my components in a single request. So each interaction I do with my backend, it's just one request. There's no over or under fetching. So what is over fetching? Over fetching is when I have to consume more data than I want. That's a request one of my backend engineers designed, but uh, now we are using it in a different context and have to swallow all the data we don't even need. And under fetching is when we saw these IDs in the REST request, this is under fetching because I don't want to have this ID. I actually want the data behind that ID. I don't want the author ID or the uh, news ID or whatever. I want the news and I want the author, some data from them. And GraphQL is built on a strong type system. We will explore what that means. That means uh, you have very strong data contracts. And this makes GraphQL predictable to use. On top of that, 
GraphQL is real time. So before we look at some code, in GraphQL we have three operations. There, there's the query operation, it's a read operation, and it's the get in rest, side effect free reads on my data model. Then we have write operations, which are mutations. It's the put, post, patch, delete, and rest, or whatever you do there. Um, and it's causing side effects to your system. So a mutation causes always a side effect to your system, where a query is side effect free. And lastly, we have subscription. It's our events in the system, so that's our real timeness. You don't have that in REST. I mean, there are techniques how you can do that in a RESTful application with WebSockets or whatever, or SignalR, but these are add-on technologies. In GraphQL, everything is designed into GraphQL. So let's have a look at how we can build a GraphQL server in .NET. So I'm going over here to VS Code, and at the moment there's nothing in here. And uh, I'm starting just by creating a simple web application. So we're going to do .NET New Web. And then we basically have just a REST API here. Or well, it's not even a REST API, it's just an endpoint that says hello world. So how can I make that a GraphQL API? So that's easy. We have to essentially add one package. And let me get rid of that here. And that's the hot chocolate ASP.NET Core package. Um, <coughs> since I'm building that library, I'm always using the pre-release and never have a stable version. So let's grab the latest. Uh, and then we basically are able to do GraphQL. Let's quickly re reload that. So VS Code has all the types we need in. And then let's rewrite it into a GraphQL server. So the first thing I told you is that we have something called an operation type, or we have operations. And operations are represented essentially by a class. So I can come up here with a query operation, and that is basically my operation type in GraphQL. The next thing we need is something that resolves data, that gets us the data. So let's start with something simple and create a hello world field in GraphQL. So to do that, I'm introducing here a simple method. Let's call that uh, hello, or say hello. And uh, then we pass in an, an argument here, maybe we pass in the name. And let's also give it a default. Maybe if somebody doesn't pass in the name, we want it to be world. And And then we just have a string function here to compose the data. Right. Okay, hello. And then let's say name in here, and then we're done. Okay, that should work. That is a valid GraphQL server basically now, but we don't have a GraphQL server yet. So what we need to do is register a GraphQL server with our web application builder here. So we're going to do builder.services.add GraphQL server. And that adds the GraphQL server essentially to our DI. And then we chain in the query type we, down, we have down here and say, okay, the query type that we have, that's actually this thing down there. So we're going to say query here. And the last thing we need to do is add the transport. Because this GraphQL server just lives now in our DI, but to use it, we need a transport layer that actually can speak GraphQL. So we're gonna map here the GraphQL transport, and then we are good to go. So this is a valid GraphQL server. We can start it now, and it should work. Watch. Okay, this comes up. And it will give me here the endpoint, localhost, and nothing is there. The reason for that is that per specification, per GraphQL over HTTP specification, the GraphQL endpoint is always the GraphQL route. So you always have GraphQL hosted on this GraphQL route. Is it HTTPS? Quickly fix that. Temporary might not be available. Unsafe. Okay. 
that is embarrassing, but uh, let's fix that. Let's quickly see what the problem is. It's always something with the ports. I did that. Next one. This should work. Yeah, that's always when you do live demos, they always go wrong. But it should take it. Let me quickly switch to Safari. Okay, that doesn't work. Let's generate quickly something. That is actually the coolest demo because it's it's working so well in all my talks, but okay. Don't uh, run. Okay, if that doesn't work, then something is not right. Okay, so this is uh, the graphical server template we use. The other thing should also use, so let me just uh, introduce here our resolver that we actually did. Say hello. <coughs> okay, that's the resolver I built before. I'm just doing here a say hello, and then let's do it as a static. And then we start it quickly, and then let's go back to the thing here. So the, what is striking is when I open this endpoint here, you can see that we get actually a website. And that is a tool called Banana Cake Pop. It's our GraphQL IDE. And I can explore with this actually my endpoint here. So what you can see here is, and let me just zoom that in that uh, I have a schema reference here and I can already see that I have a query type and this query type has here this say hello field and what is interesting is that I have here the argument I have in my C sharp code which is a string we have here an exclamation mark but we also have this default so what's happening here is that we infer the C sharp types and from that infer the GraphQL schema and I can also dive in here into the column view and essentially see, okay, there is my say hello world and has this. So if I want to run that, I can write a GraphQL query like I did um, before in the demo slides, run that and get hello world. This is my default. Or I can specify an argument here and say, for instance, Michael, run that. And then, okay, it's not surprising, it's just a string function, but uh, you have this nice C sharp to GraphQL is essentially one to one. Actually, GraphQL has more type constructs than C sharp, so you have even discriminated unions, uh, and that allows you to build a very nice interface. So let's go back to the slides. So, what we saw here is that we wrote essentially an operation type like this in C sharp. And this guy here, we call a resolver, and it resolves data for us. And a resolver is, in this case, translated into SDL code, GraphQL SDL code. And uh, this is essentially the GraphQL type representation. We call that an object type in GraphQL, which is a class in C Sharp. And uh, in GraphQL, we call these kinds fields. Fields are like methods, they have arguments, and they have defaults. GraphQL can have more complex defaults than .NET, like we could also have an object structure here. In .NET, we only can have flat uh, scalar values. Also, interesting is we have here this bang operator. In uh, .NET, it means shut up. In GraphQL, it means um, it's non-nullable, right? So the non-nullability is reversed. That means in C-sharp, a string without any 
Annotation is non-nullable, whereas with a question mark, it's nullable. In GraphQL, it's nullable by default, and with the bang operator, it's non-nullable. Okay, so why is GraphQL so amazing? It's not only because of the efficient data fetching. It's actually amazing because it lets us model an interface to our core business domain. And uh, or you could say it lets us expose our business layer in a much richer way. So Facebook, when they build it, they actually took their business layer, said, how can we expose it without compromising anything here and giving people just the ability to pick and choose from our business model um, what they need. And the business model should be like a human readable model of what you try to do. So GraphQL is transport agnostic. That's important to know. That's why I could add the GraphQL server and it would be a full functioning GraphQL server inside my ASP.NET Core server without it being able to interact over the wire. Nowadays, we have the GraphQL over HTTP spec and uh, the most common way to interact with GraphQL is an HTTP post. And it's designed to work with HTTP 1.1, but also with newer HTTP versions and adds more features as you have more modern HTTP versions. But since Facebook has so many clients also in developing countries, they always um, ensure that it works with even very old HTTP specs. Uh, you can also use HTTP GET for things like queries, things that are side effect free, mutations don't work over GET. Uh, and we have like for real time data, we also have WebSockets or HTTP SSE. And in advanced cases, even gRPC could be the transport of GraphQL. So let's talk about modern applications. For me, a modern applications must be awesome. So let's have a look at that. So when we go at this application, you can see it fetches very efficiently data. For instance, I just went back, it didn't fetch more data because it has kind of a client-sided cache. That means we essentially know each entity that uh, we fetched already and what we fetched from this entity. So when I update one of these entity through a fetch, Everywhere where I use this piece of data will be updated. So these, uh, this application is reactive. You can also see that when I go here, for instance, to the um, Bitcoin, that actually we get the data that we have here, but it's also reactive. You can see as the Bitcoin price update, it's not a real price, so don't buy. Uh, it's fake data, right? Uh, but you, you could see that the price changed every now and then. We, we change it in the back end. We have actually a random function that sometimes sends down just an update. Um, but that is awesome. Like when I use an application that is reactive, gives me updates, data is always consistent everywhere, and it's just fast. That is a modern application. Uh, what's also a modern application is a thing with very strong contracts because that makes it easy to develop. Because back end and front end engineer know what they are talking about. They can compile against that. We have static typing and, as I said, reactive. But one of the major things I think is great about GraphQL is that we have these fast iterations. It's not anymore that I need a specific request on the backend and I have to back with my backend engineers that they implement this request for me. No, it's just they expose the world to me and I just pick from the world what I need. Let's have a look at how we can do data fetching. Uh, and I hope this demo goes better than the last one. So let's kill this and go to demo two. So, and what we're going to build now is basically the back end for this application that I showed you. So, this is essentially the app that we built so far. We have here our Hello World Resolver, uh, but we also have here now some data. This is an EF Core DB context that you find everywhere. Uh, and we have now here an asset, which is our cryptocurrency, and we have the asset price. So what I want to do is expose that to the world. 
So in GraphQL, we already learned that a, a, a thing called a resolver exposes us data. So in order to expose now an entity and let people query for that entity, we would just uh, introduce here a new resolver, get assets, that looks something like this. I'm returning here a queryable. Does everybody know what a queryable really is? No? So a queryable is not an enumerable. It's actually a query builder that is executed the moment you enumerable it, uh, so you enumerate it. And that is cool because this concept, we can use that in GraphQL with the DB context. So you don't have to have that, but if you, uh, if you have a queryable structure, we will just um, understand it. So the second thing is here that we grab our DB context and we just return it. We return the entities that we query here. And we have here uh, also the asset context as an argument in our resolver. We call that resolver level dependency injection. Because GraphQL is uh, de dependent on resolvers. You can see I can have multiple resolvers in here in my query type. And uh, I don't want to instantiate all my services every time I get a request and I don't use them. So uh, we decided to implement something where you essentially scope services to their resolver and only instantiate what you need for this request. Okay, so I added this thing, one line of code basically, into here. I already wired here my GraphQL server up like before, and, and now we can just run it, .NET watch, because we're gonna change it, and then we wait, and yeah, we already have this guy here. We just refresh the query here, you can see that my schema doesn't work, why not? Is, this a... Is it? Oh, yes! Thank you. Why do they do random ports? Okay. Cool. Okay, so what we can see is that we have a new schema here. And uh, when I go into my Schema Explorer, I can see that the asset is there. I exposed that. I can drill into that. Actually, let's go in the, in the column view here. It's much better to view at. I have the asset here. I can drill into that. You can see the asset price here. So I have all the data structure suddenly exposed. It was kind of one line, and now I have all this data here. And it's not only exposed. I can just query it. Let's just go in here, maybe get the name and the symbol so we uh, know what uh, cryptocurrency we query, we query it, and boom, we have the data. And we can scroll it and scroll it and scroll it. Okay, we should have thought about pagination. Let's talk about it. So when we do pagination in traditional APIs, we have a concept called offset-based pagination. So this is a skip take. It comes from our database maybe uh, limit or whatever term you use. But the problem for Facebook when they implemented offset-based pagination is that uh, people that scrolled their newsfeed got the same stories over and over again. Because tons of people are adding new stories. And if you page with a skip limit algorithm, you are prone to get the same data again because data is coming in at the top and if you do a skip and limit per index positions, yeah, you would get repeated data. So what they came up with is a new algorithm called cursor-based pagination, um, or we call it also key set pagination, where we would navigate based on entities. So we would not say, skip the f uh, first five and give me the next five, we would, uh, we would say after entity with the ID 11, give me the next five. And that means as new data comes in, it kind of goes in page zero and doesn't concern our paging session. So let's see how we can implement that in our backends. So I'm basically going here to my resolver and uh, let's refactor it a bit. I'm doing use paging, and then we're done. Uh, because it was more about the concept, and uh, we basically implemented that for you. So 
Let's go back to our client, refresh that. And then you can see this is now wrong because if you go in our assets here, you can see that we get an asset connection. An asset connection is our paging type. It comes from the graph theories where we have connections and edges. And in this case, we have here edges. And each edge has, edge has now a cursor. And I can splice my data now with these cursors. I can go backwards or split data like uh, I can do with arrays in C-sharp or whatever. I also have a flattened structure here, which is nodes, which is just the assets. And then I could use a more simplified version where I use a paging info here and use just end and start cursors. So when I want to query that, basically I would now do nodes. And uh, yeah, let's get the name and the symbol again. And also we get the paging info. And because we just want to do a forward pagination in this case, let's just get the end cursor. Um, and maybe let's just get the first two. Fetch that. And now we just have two items here. And you can see that we have here the cursor. So we could grab the cursor. At the moment, we have the Bitcoin here, and then we could just ask for, uh, give me the first two after this guy, right? Then we could we would get the next two. We could also go backwards, say, give me the first two before this item, and so on and so forth. Okay, let's go back to our slides. Um, oh, no, let's do one more thing. And then I explain what middleware are. So in our client application, let's quickly go to this guy here. In our client application, you will notice it's a lot about lists. Always it's about lists in client application. So in this case, we have here a screener list, which is a list of our cryptocurrencies. And uh, a typical concept is that you can search for stuff, uh, for instance, um, Bitcoin here, or you can sort stuff like, uh, I want to have it sorted by the 24 hour change of the price, or I want to sort it by um, this symbol, or again by market cap, right? What I uh, basically want to have is a way to tell the server how to sort and filter that. And this is not a database query language, so use it with care. Uh, you should only expose what you really need to sort from the client side, not just everything. Um, and also only allow things to be filtered, what you need in your client components. Otherwise, there you get full text searches on things that are not indexed and things like that. So in this case, we want to make this uh, sortable and filterable. And this is an add-on feature. So we have to first uh, opt into it. So we are registering that here, add sorting and add filtering. And now we have the capability there, so we can now ask here to get the data, use sorting, and use filtering. And then we go back here, so it should already be restarted, yes. Now we go back here to our client, go into our schema reference, let's refresh, refetch our schema. And what we can see here is that we have now more arguments because we have now a where argument and an order <coughs> argument. And that means I suddenly in my operation could say, give me the first two that uh, where the, whatever, the symbol. It looks a bit like Mongo, the query syntax. Uh, where it starts with maybe B, Bitcoin. Yeah, and then I get the Bitcoin. I also get Bitcoin Cash and things like that. So I can now from the client side sort and filter the stuff and only get things that I need. And that's how we do that in the screener component. We actually send them in a customized GraphQL query here. Okay, so let's talk about middleware. So what are middleware? So when we look at our component or our operations that we just built, 
uh, we have this thing that is called resolver. And this attribute on top is actually a middleware. It's the same pattern that ASP.NET Core uses on the transport. And we can add more middleware. And what we are doing there is actually building a pipeline. That's a pipeline that is where use paging is invoked first, and then it calls the next element in the pipeline. In our bigger pipeline, we have this use filtering and use sorting there. So we would first invoke next. So please invoke the next component in the pipeline. Then filtering would, would do the same until we reach the resolver middleware, which would return the query bill, and then we have like these expression applies on top of the query bill. That works well with query bill just out of the box. If you have proper in a proper application layer, it works still because you can tell us how we have to build up maybe a query object that we can pass into your application layer, right? Okay, so this is middleware and it allows us to take the GraphQL query like this and craft the perfect SQL if you're doing a GraphQL on data layer, which you shouldn't, but we could do that. Um, if you have a proper application layer, we would craft you a filter object and pass that in your business logic. Okay, so let's talk a bit about GraphQL as a gateway, because when Facebook released GraphQL, we didn't have something like this. Uh, Facebook actually did something like this. As I said, they inferred from their business layer their uh, GraphQL schema. But people started to doing this with the open source version of GraphQL. Basically, everybody already had a shitty backend. And they would put GraphQL in front of it and it would just feel nice suddenly. So in our case, we have this asset part that we built together here with entity framework, but maybe we have like backend services, like something that aggregates price changes and its rest. And maybe we have a price history service and all this kind of stuff staying around. So we could just wrap GraphQL around it by typing these things with GraphQL types, and then it would just work and pass it through. So we're using GraphQL as a gateway. And uh, we are focusing in on this service. It's, uh, it's basically an Azure function that aggregates our price changes. And uh, we would like to integrate that into our GraphQL layer. So let's do that. So we could just gen generate with NSWAG or whatever, like strong typed version and then infer it. Or we reshape it with GraphQL. And what I show you now is we will reshape it with GraphQL. So let's get to demo three. And okay, so this is the same service, a couple of iterations ahead. We have now accounts here, we also have assets here, and we have this yeah, REST service somewhere standing around. Let's see if I still have it somewhere here. Uh, no? Uh, one second. Let me just grab. Grab this somewhere in here. Infrastructure, yes. There. Okay, this is the URL to my REST backend. And uh, as you can see, we can do a GET request to this URL and pass in here the, the Bitcoin, for the, the symbol of the cryptocurrency, and then the span over which we want the aggregation. And then we could do this REST request, and we would get basically back here some data, this guy. And actually, we want to integrate that into our model in GraphQL. So most is inferred from our C-sharp types. So how could we do that? So it's basically, it's, it's pretty easy. So we basically just create here a schema GraphQL file. GraphQL has a thing called the SDL, that's the schema definition language. And this allows us to, um, wait, 
to model the data structure without the code. So I could say, okay, I have a thing here called asset price change. It will have a property percentage change, which will be a non-nullable float. And this comes from a JSON object. I will pass you a JSON object, and from that you will extract that and uh, represent that as this GraphQL type. And this type definition, we can register with hot chocolate. We can go here and uh, just say add document from file in this case. And I'm just pointing to the schema file. And now my schema already has this, this type definition there. We don't have an implementation. We need to add that. And that's another resolver. So we would go here to our assets type. And there is a price type. We want to add it to our price type. So what we can do in GraphQL or in Hot Chocolate is building extensions to our types. So we have here, this is our domain entity, let's say. And uh, what we're going to do here is add a new class and say this class extends this domain entity with additional GraphQL stuff. We don't want to put that on our domain entities. So we have a separate class that just introduces the extra stuff we need for GraphQL. So, and in this case, we want to now connect the rest data with this price object. And what we're just going to do here is introduce a resolver, and we call that get price change or get change. And this looks horrible at the moment. We're going to change it. But it's the most simple way to do it. We say, okay, this is actually a thing that is called get change, and it returns an asset price change here. And we pass in an argument which, which, called, uh, which is a span. And then you're going to take the HTTP client and then you fetch some raw data and just return the JSON object into the execution engine here. Let's just run that. It's actually very bad code, but uh, let's run it. So this is our thing. It should still work. Okay, awesome. We get this data. You can see that here. Uh, I'm going to rid of this filter. And by default, actually, and let me show you that, we're going to fetch 10 items. Because the paging middleware, if you don't specify anything, we're going to uh, fetch 10 items. Actually, we don't need that. And we're going to fetch that. And you can see yeah, 10 items. And it's 26 milliseconds, which is good. And now we're going to query for our REST data. So I'm diving into the price object here. And uh, then we uh, go for the change. That is our change span. Actually, refresh the schema here quickly. And then we have the change here. It's our change span. I can pass in. I want to actually have this aggregated over months. And then we want to have the percentage change, right? And then we execute that. And oh, one second is not good. Because what is now happening is that before each thing, we go to the REST endpoint and fetch this data. OK, while we have the shape that we want to have, so if we go here into our schema and look at the shape, it's all good, right? So we have here the, the structure integrated as if it's one thing. We have now this bad performance. And this is where we should talk about a concept that Facebook actually introduced. And they called it preparables orig originally. Uh, but nowadays it's to referred to as a data loader. So a data loader, when we look at our query structure here, we are actually doing one HTTP request for, uh, for every item that we fetch. And we don't know where this object is used in our graph. Um, this, is also, this also applies to data requests. And what the data loader essentially does is to soften this effect, is to have a component in between. And what we would do is actually don't go to the data source, but ask the data loader to give us this piece of data and then batch request everything. So how this works is, uh, these are slides I haven't uh, renovated yet, so they're kind of ugly, but okay. So we have this resolver there. So the execution engine executes the resolvers. The resolvers asks the data loader for some data. And the data loader is something that has a thing. It's called a promise cache or in C-sharp, a task cache. 
So when we ask the data loader, the data loader looks into its task cache or promise cache to look up if there's a promise for a certain key. If that's not there, it will create a new promise, give us this promise and store it in the task cache. What basically happens now is we get something awaitable back and we will execute all the resolvers we have and then we are basically deadlocked. And when the execution engine in GraphQL sees that you're deadlocked because you're awaiting all these uh, promises from a data loader, it will start batching these requests. So it's no matter how deep your GraphQL request graph is, we will fetch this very efficiently by batching. So for this, you need an endpoint that can do that. So our endpoint must be batch, uh, batchable in this case. And uh, it's not only about fetching efficiency, uh, efficient, it's also about improving consistency. Meaning if you fetch multiple, uh, multiple times in your query graph something from a user, it's always the same user because we get this result thing back from our promise cache. So let's have a look at how we can integrate that. So with the data loader, and I already built here data loader, it's the asset price change data loader here. Basically, we put all the ugly HTTP code in there. It could also be a generated client that you use here. It doesn't matter. I just made it quick and dirty. Uh, but what this interface is about, we essentially have here a batch data loader. And the interface that we have here is that we get in a list of keys that the execution engine essentially collected. And we return a dictionary of key to object. So the execution engine will actually ask this, here's our complex data fetching code and our resolvers would then be simplified. Let's get rid of this guy here and say new get change. And now look much simplified. So a data loader always have this load method that's standardized. We pass in the key and we get back basically the JSON element in this case. So this allows us to fetch very efficiently and also integrate data from custom sources. So let's rerun our query here. So the first time it's warming up the schema, but you can see now we have 105 milliseconds and we are fetching from a REST endpoint that is in the cloud. So super efficient. Okay, we don't have a lot of time anymore, so let's quickly dive in. So that was optimizing with data loaders. Let's talk about mutations because so far we just talked about querying data. So mutations are a little bit different. Let's have a look at the structure. This is a query. We learned that, and actually that is a fully qualified query. Uh, as far as we're concerned, we only wrote the queries like this. If you write this, what the uh, GraphQL query engine actually does is put a query in, in front of it. Because we know, okay, by default you want a query. And the second thing here is actually the method name, if you want, operation name you call that, get asset. And if you look at that, that is actually like a stored procedure, if you will. So you define, I have a query called get assets. It has the following inputs, first as an argument here, and uh, then we have all these selections here. We call them selection sets. That's where you select your data. That, that's what you're going to have. And in a query, this is all a query. So all is side effect free. We could have for each field a separate thread, right? In a mutation, that is different. In a mutation, this is not a query. It is actually a mutation. In a mutation, the top field on the mutation type is only a mutation. Everything beneath the mutation, so the watch list and symbol, is actually reselecting the changed state of the server. So you're changing something and then you read the change. If you, for, for instance, create something new, you can select the newly created ID from the object you just created. So in a mutation, we have a sequential execution. That means if I have a mutation where I first add something, uh, then I would do the mutation, add, change the state of my server, and then I would, in parallel, resolve all the uh, change fields, so all the query fields beneath that, reading the change, 
then I could delete the same object and again read the change. Okay, let's have a look at implementing mutations. That goes quick. And then if we have time, we can also look at subscriptions. Okay, so this is the same the same graph, but a lot of iterations ahead. We have now uh, more types in here. Let's restore that quickly. And um, what we also have here is now mutations. So what I'm adding here is now mutations to add something to a watch list. So a mutation actually looks uh, very similar to anything else in the net. Let's uh, maybe see if I have my add watch list mutation. So this is basically the bare minimum. I'm creating a method here. I have my inputs there. You can see symbol. Uh, I also have some state here, the username that, that is locked in, and I also have services in here. So uh, a mutation is basically where you have all the uh, domain behavior that you express. Reading is always easy. It could be pre-compiled models. But in a mutation, that is where our business logic lives, right? So let's quickly add the body here. So this is basically creating um, uh, the watch list entry here, adding the symbol to our watch list and saving it. So um, basically changing the data. But mutations are always also about uh, validation, right? We always have something like this where we uh, check the state of what we are doing. And this could live in your domain layer. Um, in this case, we are checking is some is the user um, locked in? Is there a user to which we can add the watch list? And also, is the symbol correct that is passed in? But these are domain exceptions. So in GraphQL, we have two kinds of exceptions. Technical exceptions. They happen when your database is gone. Uh, but we also have domain exceptions. And uh, these we need to expose. In Hot Chocolate, we can do that by just saying, OK, I have an error here. And the following exception is actually a domain exception. It's expected that this could happen. You can also model them with error objects and uh, unions. But in this case, I'm using just the exception flow here. And now we have a very nice readable mutation here. It's called add asset to watch list. Uh, we're doing our stuff here. And we are also telling the GraphQL server what kinds of errors are domain errors. Let's quickly run that, and then I'm out of time, I think. Uh, yeah, this I fix quickly. OK. OK, so I'm refetching here my schema. And the cool thing about that, that's OK. I'm not OK. Why? Last demo of the day. Do it again. Rough well. No. Why not? Okay, I show you the, the, the fixed API because I'm uh, out of time. So I have this API actually already hosted. And the coolest thing about these mutations is, and I'm diving into here the column view. You can see here's my mutation. I have the add asset to watch list mutation. And what you can see is each mutation has its own payload. That's important because if you refactor, we are refactoring safe. So if we, for instance, change the payload for mutation A, we are not affecting anything on mutation B. The second thing is that all the errors I exposed, you can see here's a list of errors. They belong to my schema. And I can see what kind of errors I have to handle in my front end. And that is uh, very nice for the front end developer because you know what you have to design in your forms to make that work. So if I write a mutation, I would typically do it like this. I have here whatever add assets to watch list. And then I have here my errors. And we have a construct like inline fragments that I can use. And there I can, for instance, say, OK, I want to catch this kind of exception. If, it's, if this exception, for instance, happens, show me the message. Or in the case of the 
uh, unknown asset, I could just output the symbol that is wrong or the symbols that are wrong. And I also could have like this default catch if it's any error, any domain error that the backend engine engineers might have added since I created my server, I can always catch this message here. Okay, so with this uh, we are done. I had real time, but uh, let's skip over that. Uh, the key message behind GraphQL, and that's what people don't get in the beginning, is actually GraphQL gives you the capability to build the most optimized REST API that you ever can come up with. Why is that? Because at development time, you write these nice GraphQL queries, you write this nice component code, but as soon as you deploy this thing to the web, it will strip these queries and um, put essentially something that looks very much like REST APIs. So let me show you uh, Twitter, which is using, for instance, GraphQL. So we can quickly go here to the developer tools. And if I like here, for instance, Mart, uh, Martin, the, his tweet, uh, then you can see that we get here a new thing that is called favorite tweet. And this is actually a GraphQL request. I can look into that. And you can see here's a variable. This is, if we look at the, uh, at the response, actually, you can see this is the data shape of GraphQL here. And what they are doing is you see no query because they only have the query hash here. So the moment we go to production, we strip all the queries automatically at the build process from our clients, replace them just with hashes. The GraphQL queries are stored on the GraphQL server and it becomes the fastest REST API that you can build. And uh, yeah, that's about GraphQL. What's this kind? Okay, no, let's go. Okay, I'm done. If you have questions, you can hit me up later. And I also, if you want to uh, contact me, then you can do so.